you know, maybe I'm going to set this computer on this. I bought this uh, crystal, man. <laughs> you know, I bought this at there. I went to my hometown, Mount Joy, Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah. Which is which is just super Jesus land. <laughs> you know, I mean, like, just, I, I mean, I, I don't know. And and so there was like a, a pagan metaphysical new age <laughs> store. And I just, I'm like, look, I just want to support these people. Like you, whatever, man, you go, you know, and, 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 and like, you know, who would have thought? And so I bought, I bought, and I like rocks. So <laughs> that's glorious. And I'm going to is... set my computer on it to, to like lift it up. Yes. So, you yes. know, people say this stuff doesn't work, but look, at it does. <laughs> exactly. Crystals yes. work. I love it. Welcome everyone to the Majesty of Reason today. I am joined by uh, Dr. Eric Steinhardt to discuss one of his books that is currently being written. It is entitled Atheistic Platonism. And uh, to give you guys a taste of it, I'm actually gonna read the summary uh, of the book. So uh, here we go into that. So here's the summary. Atheism is stuck in a nihilistic rut. Its nihilism makes it unable to solve moral and metaphysical problems, which are both deep and personally urgent. So people turn away from atheism towards theism. Atheistic Platonism is an alternative to both theism and nihilistic atheisms. Platonic atheism affirms abstract laws and objects which do not depend on any minds. The Platonic atheist says the work attributed to divine persons is more accurately assigned to the system of abstract laws and objects. Far from being powerless, these abstract objects generate all possible causalities. Atheistic Platonism argues for a plenitude of mathematical objects and an infinite plurality of universes. It advocates objective moral laws and values for the agents, like humans, who emerge in those universes. It says physical deities are future possible superhuman organisms and machines. It naturalizes ancient theurgical practices. Atheistic Platonism defines a meaningful way of life, which facilitates personal self-transformation. Atheistic Platonists argue for computational theories of life after death. Atheistic Platonism includes a rich system of spiritual symbols. It values mystical experiences. The system of abstract objects gives meaning, value, and purpose to life. So uh, with that out of the way, Eric, thank you for coming on. Sure. Glad to be here. Glad you're having me. Yeah. Yeah. So um, like I said, we're talking about this book. And I think, uh, well, just for the audience, we're just going to go through each chapter and just discuss the contents of the chapters and hopefully get some uh, interaction, you know, I might play the bad cop, throw, you know, level some objections here and there. Um, sure. So, so we'll see, we'll see how things go. So um, chapter one is called uh, Twilight Atheism. Uh, and for everyone, you guys can check links in the description to uh, Eric, Eric's uh, website, and you can check out the chapter abstracts and as well as the table of contents. So definitely check that out, everyone. But uh, chapter one is called Twilight Atheism. And you argue essentially that a lot of contemporary atheism is stuck in Plato's cave, which is also Nietzsche's cave. So what do you mean by that? And can you can you take us through chapter one? Yeah, I mean, I, I am, you know, there's especially for interactions with atheists on Facebook and social media and stuff like that. You know, I constantly get hit with this weird stuff. I think it's weird, you know, so people say things like, oh, you can't use the word spiritual if you're an atheist, or you can't say that, you know, evolution designs things. You know, Dan Dennett wrote a whole book that talks about how, you know, Darwin's dangerous idea, evolution designs things. And there are people who say, oh, you can't use that word. And like, why not? And then, well, design means there's a mind, you know, or the universe doesn't have a purpose. It can't have a purpose because purpose means there must be a God. And I just find all this kind of to be bizarre. You know, like, like, and it, it, it struck me that so many of the atheists that I interact with, at least on social media, and, and even in the academy, um, are really cultural Christians. You know, they, they, I'm like, well, why does design mean that there has to be an intelligence? You know, it's like, oh, you're using a Christian dictionary. And so I get really frustrated with that. And I, I get really frustrated with atheists who say things like, you know, uh, you can't get ought from is, man. You can't do it. Huh. You know, and it's like, why not? Hume said. And it's like, <laughs> or Hume showed, you know, and I, I, there's no 
point in repeating it verbatim, but you know, I pretty much have the paragraph memorized from Hume. <laughs> Hume, Hume sh there's no argument. You know, and then Hume goes on after he writes this little paragraph and does hundreds of pages of, of, of moral philosophy, you know, getting oughts from ises. And you're just kind of like, you know, one of my favorite offenders is Sean Carroll, who's just like, well, there can't be any objective moral laws because Hume said, and you're like, yeah, you're a great physicist, man, but maybe not this, <laughs> you know, or Alex Rosenberg has got oh, that book, you know, like, yeah. on, you know, atheism is nihilism, <laughs> yeah. Every, life is meaningless. And you, uh, you know, and you're just kind of like, where does this come from? Exactly. And I think the Plato's cave thing and the Nietzsche's cave thing, you know, I take that metaphor from Nietzsche who's got that um, gay science section 108, you know, it says, oh, there's this cave, you know, where, uh, you know, the shadow of Buddha was shown for a thousand years and, you know, God is dead, but there are still caves where that, that have his shadow and we have to get rid of the shadows, you know, which is exactly what Nietzsche means, you, you know, getting rid of this assumption of Christian categories and Christian concepts. And, uh, you know, I talk about that in that first chapter that these things come out as kinds of if then rules that both theists and atheists are committed to. Mm -hmm. And theists say things like, if there's no God, then there's no objective morality. And atheists go, oh yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. And you're kind of like, wait, what? what yeah <laughs> like why would an atheist think that that's a shadow of god you know or if there's no god there's no purpose to the the universe has no purpose mm -hmm. and or you know if there's no god there's no life you know one of my favorites if there's no god there's no life after death uh and you got to think immediately like why you know what's the argument i mean why would an atheist I mean, imagine saying this, if there's no God, complex life can't exist. I mean, every theist believes that. And so, I mean, most theists believe that. And so, you know, imagine an atheist saying, oh yeah, that's right. And somebody says, well, there's evolution. And the atheist just says, no, no, can't be because, you know, then there would have to be a God. And you just say like, no, that's absurd. Uh, so just because there, you know, you, you shouldn't say if there's no God, there's no objective morality. You should say there's no God. Now let's see if there's objective morality, mm -hmm. you know, or there's no God, there's no life after death. Well, you shouldn't say that. You should say, well, let's see. And you can't say, well, okay, all the old religious theories of life after death are false because, you know, we know the old religious theories of the emergence of complex life are false didn't stop us from figuring out scientific theories. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, okay, divine command theory or theories of, you know, uh, the dependency of morality on, on God or a divine mind, those are all false. Doesn't mean that there's no, uh, you know, scientific or naturalistic or platonic or other theory of morality, objective morality that has nothing to do with God, right? So, I, you know, I really get frustrated with um, atheists who are still cultural Christians, mm -hmm. you know, and um, that's kind of the, that's one of the motivations for this. Another motivation is that uh, there's an increasing number of theists, William Lane Craig and a whole bunch of others, who have gotten sort of very worried about um, atheistic Platonism. Right. I mean, on the one hand, they see atheistic Platonism as a real threat to theism, mm -hmm. meaning, you know, if Platonism were true, God just can't exist. You know, the theistic God that they like to talk about can't exist. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, that guy's gone. And uh, so Platonism is a and Platonism is a novel kind of threat to theism. And it's a it's a threat that theists take much more seriously. Because if I'm just a like, you know, physicalist or a materialist or something like that, I mean, you know, theists, Christians, you know, they don't deny the existence of the physical world. Mm -hmm. Right. They're like, yeah, there's there's physical stuff. There's also this God thing. Mm -hmm. Right. But they don't, you know, get it right in the video. Yeah, this is God. 
you know, they don't deny that there's like matter. Uh, most of them, you know, yeah. maybe some who have some odd theories about that, but you know, they're like, yeah, we we read physics books. Um, and so materialism or physicalism or a lot of what, you know, atheists say is naturalism doesn't really, because there's always nature's God. Mm -hmm. And it does, it's not really a threat or it's a threat that's really easily dismissed by a lot of theists, right? Because they say, well, okay, we can do all the stuff you're doing. We just add some, an extra ingredient, you know? Um, but if you've got Platonism and you think there are, you know, abstract objects, mathematical objects, you know, including, you know, moral laws and values and things like that, you know, you're actually like threatening the theist on their own ground. Mm -hmm. right? And it also, and it causes problems for their God, right? Like their God can't exist if there's a platonic plenitude of abstract objects. Mm -hmm. Or it, it exists and it just becomes a completely trivial, you know, a, a trivial thing. Yeah. Right. Um, so the theists have, have started to take notice that atheistic Platonism um, is a, a, a threat they take much more serious. They're starting to take much more seriously. Yeah. Right. Uh, so that, you know, I was kind of motivated by that too. And nobody, uh, you know, Theists have argued a little bit, oh, you know, Platonism, uh, but nobody's yet really developed um, Platonism in an atheistic way. You know, I thought for sure somebody would have done it. Um, <laughs> I, you know, and I haven't found anyone. I mean, I kind of got into it, uh, my last book on Dawkins, yeah, believing in Dawkins. Um, and I thought surely somebody's written a whole bunch about this, but not so much. Interesting. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, there are a few things that I definitely want to touch on there. So the first thing is just like, I like how you pointed out that some of the more Alex Rosenberg type of things, it's like, yeah, they have the material world and so on. And Alex Rosenberg is going to say, that's all there is. But the theists are like, yeah, we agree that there is such a thing as a material world, but we just have more. But by contrast, the threat of Platonism is like, it's not this thing where the theists are like, yeah, we have that. We just have something else. It's this thing that these entities that seem to be positively disruptive to the worldview in question, as for instance, you have like William Lane Craig saying that this is one of the biggest, uh, Platonism itself is one of the biggest problems that threatens theism. Uh, if Platonism is true, then there are these objects that don't depend on God, uh, which violates right. traditional doctrine of a seity sovereignty. Everything apart from God has its being sourced in God. Um, and so if you have Platonism, that, that traditional commitment of, that core commitment of theism, traditional theism is simply false. So. I, I like how you pointed out that there's this kind of distinctive threat uh, that seems more challenging than uh, the more kind of the, the nihilistic atheists, as you put it. It's a more robust kind of worldview. It's a more robust kind of threat. So that's one thing that I wanted to say. And then the second thing that I want to say is like, I like how you pointed out how uh, these kind of what you're calling nihilistic atheisms, they're almost playing in the sandbox of the theist, like of the, of the Christian theist, right? It's, I, I'm reminded of, uh, what is it, Peter Berger, his use of like um, legitimation, right? So like religion is right. oftentimes used a, as a mode of legitimation and it like legitimates morality by saying like, listen, God is the, the legitimizer, the legitimation or the, the justification or the ground or the basis of morality such that if you remove that legitimating factor, then the, the phenomenon collapses. You don't have objective morality. And so like, um, a lot of these atheists are playing within that mode of legitimation. They're playing within that framework. And it's like- That's the cave, man. Yeah, exactly. The thing to see is like, that's the very framework that more robust versions of atheism would then challenge. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, I think that was a great, uh, a great summary of like sort of the issues that kind of motivate the view and the ways that, um, you know, the, the, like, I like how you said it's disruptive to theism in a lot of ways, because- mm -hmm. Um, you know, it, it talks about these other things, which, you know, math is used in science, for instance, fine. I mean, that's scientific. And yet it's like, if you're really committed to this and you're going to say like, well, I'm a Platonist and there's mathematical realism. It's not just that, you know, God loses God's, you know, aseity or independence. God actually becomes just one of the objects generated by this abstract background. Mm -hmm. If there were a God, I mean, I don't think there is. But even on a Platonic view, I don't think there is. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, I think Platonism rules out anything like monotheism. 
uh, or an Anselmian God. It's just, you know, because now you've got infinities multiplied upon infinities, um, you know, and you're, you're, there's no top level to this thing. And if there's, you know, as things advance, they expl explode into multiplicity, not mm -hmm. unity. But it's disruptive because you're, you know, you're fighting the, the battle right there where they are, mm -hmm. right? Because they want to claim, oh yeah, you, got, you, you materialists, you physicalists, you naturalists, you can have the natural world. We got that too. We got this extra thing and it's magical and special and it's ours and you don't have anything like that. And, you know, I can say, or the Platonists can say, well, uh, yes, yes, I do. <laughs> yeah. And it's better than your thing. Yeah. You know, and and they also often, often like to say, like, we have a kind of transcendence. We have a kind of value, purpose, meaning, objectivity, yeah. these sorts of things where in there they're attacking the kind of atheistic nihilisms or nihilistic atheisms. But the Platonist comes around and is like, I have that transcendence as well. I have this more metaphysical, robust view of reality as well. I have this objectivity, this value, this meaning, this purpose as well. So it seems it seems to be much more of a direct threat there. That's right. Yeah. I got all this stuff. Got it in the trunk of my car. You want, <laughs> you know, you want some transcendence, you know? Yeah. I love it. So it's, uh, and I, and I also think, you know, a sort of third motivation is just that there's no, there are some historical reasons why atheism in the English speaking world deve has developed the way it has. Right. Um, you know, especially in, in contrast with American, it's developed out of American Protestantism. Mm -hmm. Right, um, particular evangelical fundamentalism and evangelicalism, right? I mean, so much so that there are sociologists who actually think a lot of English speak, you know, Anglophone atheism just is a Protestant sect. You know, the structures are so similar. Um, and I think it's really imperative that uh, atheists see that there are lots and lots of different ways atheism can be developed. Lots of ways you can get to it. There's lots of ways it can go, right? I mean, people, I think, tend to forget that somebody like, uh, you know, John McTaggart was an atheist, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And and it, and I, what's what reality is just a syst a network of spirits in love with each other. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. He was a hippie before it was cool. <laughs> exactly. You know, and he's an atheist. It's like yeah, there's no god you know there's an infinitude of finite spirits but there's no god mm -hmm. and he's an and he's an emphatic atheist right um and there was also you know arthur schopenhauer who has this you know radical sort of mystical view you know the world is will and representation you know and uh there's no god but man it's you know, those two guys are not naturalists or materialists. Yeah. Right. Um, so I, I, I think it's, it's, neither was Nietzsche. I mean, it's really imperative, I think, for atheists to see that there's a lot of different ways this could go. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and, you know, and, I, and again, I get frustrated. I say like, oh, I believe in mathematical, ob you know, I get such shit on social media <laughs> for saying, I believe in mathematical objects. I'm like, would you believe in ghosts? I'm like, well, no, you know, like, <laughs> you know, I mean, math is like in the science book, you know, I mean, I mean, maybe they don't exist. Fine, maybe I'm wrong, but you know, it's, it's so weird, yeah. you know? Uh, yeah, so, so those are some of the motives. Sweet, okay, so is that, is that enough for chapter one, Twilight Atheism? Should we go on to chapter two? Or well, we just go on, yeah, whatever you want, yeah. Oh, right, yeah. yeah, sweet. So let's go on to chapter two, which is called Class Theoretic Platonism. So in here, in this chapter, you, or at least Class Theoretic Platonism, develops a, a Platonic Pythagorean metaphysics using class theory. So can you kind of talk us through this? What, what's this chapter about? What is this class theory? What is Class Theoretic Platonism? Oh, yeah, man, it's really trippy shit, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, class theory is basically set theory, um, which maybe replaces one confusing word with another. Um, so yeah, set theory, you know, you start out with the empty set, you build up sets by elaboration, right? Complication of, you know, okay, there's the empty set, there's a set that has the empty set as its member there. You build up this thing called the iterative hierarchy of sets. 
And basically all mathematics can be done within the iterative hierarchy of sets. Um, maybe there's some issues on the edges, but basically, basically all math can be done in this structure. And all that exists are sets, right? Sets are just dots in a big connect the dots network with the membership relation as the connector. And this kind of, it's a very, you know, it's interesting the ancient Platonists actually have a lot of set theoretic ideas, right? Uh, this book project is not doing ancient philosophy, but I do like to turn to the ancient Platonists, right? Um, you know, which is also, I suppose, another point, right? A lot of the ancient Roman Platonists were emphatically anti-Christian. I mean, those guys were actually sort of fighting the fight at, at the first time. Right, I mean Plotinus, and uh, you know Plotinus was opposed to the to the Christians in Rome, in you know 250. Mm -hmm. um, Porphyry wrote a treatise against the Christians. Right, uh, these guys were the pagans of Rome that were you know sort of fighting against the emergence of this new religion, and that you know maybe that's good or bad, whatever they were doing, but they were there on the ground and knew what they were doing. So. Um, yeah, we start out with this mathematical framework, which comes out of, uh, you know, Plotinus and uh, sort of late Roman Platonism, right? Uh, you've got the one and the first thing the one generates is the numbers. And so we've got math, you know, and the idea is now that in math, right? So these are not my ideas here. I mean, there's, there's not much, you know, it, what's new is putting it together in certain ways. You know, you've got math and you can, you know, basically the iterative hierarchy of sets has every consistently definable structure in it. And so, you know, the structure of our universe is there, right? The structure of any possible physical universe is there, uh, assuming it's consistent. And uh, that's gonna give just sort of a fundamental ontology, right? Um, and I, I like the platonic idea of generating everything from the one. Right, so, you know, part of this, yeah, the one, being itself, right? Being itself bears the beings. And it's, it's nice to say that and to say, you know, being itself is not God, right? One of the things that happens with a lot of these concepts is they get baptized, mm -hmm. right? And you say something like, well, the, you know, there's the one. Somebody says, oh, this is God. You know, I think, uh, were you talking about Ed Fieser? Yeah, Ed Fazer, yes. Yeah, Ed Fazer, yeah. And because he does that sort of thing. He loves Absolutely. doing that. Absolutely, yeah. You know, it's like, the, you know, even though, you know, Plotinus says the one is not God, <laughs> you know, says this because for Platonists, God was the divine mind. Yeah, that's the news. That's the second hypothesis, which that's is right. ontolo ontologically subordinate to the one and is that's generated right. by the one. That's right. That's right. Because it represents um, it represents a kind of infinite complexity because of the infinitely many forms that are in, inside the divine mind. It's, it's a unified, it's a plurality. It's not a perfectly unified simplicity. Uh, in order to be perfectly simple, it would have to transcend even the distinction between subject and object, which would be transcending the distinction between the thinker and the object of thought. And so it's right. like, it's not this kind of divine intellect, which is capable of thought or understanding. Yeah, the one does not think. It has yeah. it has no consciousness. It has no knowledge. It it doesn't. You know. It you know. Strictly speaking, it doesn't even have being. Mm -hmm. It's beyond right? being. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's, pure oneness. Yeah. It's yeah. And um, you know. So, but it's explicitly not God. You know, within any Platonic system, and um, you know, within most. I mean, the time you get to. Proclus and Damascius, those guys are already Christianized, right, in the late 400s, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, it's basically become a Christian academy by that time. So we'll set those off to one side. But the, the actual, you know, Roman Platonists, uh, yeah, and Plato himself, right, the noose, that's, if you're going to say something's God, the noose is God, not the one, right? And, um, but I ain't got I ain't got no news, no divine mind, right? Because I say this is atheistic Platonism, mm -hmm. and we don't need. There's no need for. Any, there's you're not adding anything. So so somebody might say, well, the iterative hierarchy of sets is just you know sets are just or mathematical objects. The forms are just thoughts in a divine mind, but that doesn't add anything. Mm -hmm. 
you know, it doesn't add like there's yeah, nothing that adds. You already have the forms. You got like, the forms. Yeah. And if anything, it, it causes more problems because then now you have to ask the relate about the relationship between the forms and the divine mind. It's like, are they generated by? It? Are they dependent on it? Wouldn't the divine mind already have to like instantiate the the ability to even generate these things or to even harbor them? And so surely that that form would have to be prior to itself. Like you get all these different like oh, yeah. bootstrapping worries. It's like surely it just yeah. multiplies problems. Yeah, you got like a it's like it's whack a mole, man. You got like <laughs> a, a rabbit over here, and you like you know the carrot is in you know it's like yeah so you know it doesn't it it just makes things worse and it doesn't do anything right so um no there's no reason to have a divine mind you know and um you know even if you look in plotinus i mean there's there's you know his conception of the divine mind is really weird because it's not as you look at it it's not a mind at all like it's, it, I don't know what it is, uh, but I don't, you know, I'm not really, it's not an ancient philosophy book, right? We're trying to say like, look, we've got these structures, right? And if you start with the one um, and we can go through some kind of platonic, you know, we want logic, right? We, we, we're gonna do like the platonic deductions in the Parmenides, right? We got the one and what can we deduce from it, right? With, I mean, the principles of logic themselves have to be deduced from the one, uh, and, but I'm even better. Because I start with the zero, right? And that's that's really more the, the third chapter, right? The structure of being, mm -hmm. right? Um, so this is Peirce, right? Charles Sanders Peirce, right? Who, who starts with like nothing. And, you know, the nothing negates itself, right? And, and people often attribute this to Heidegger. It's, it's like, it's not Heidegger. Heidegger ripped it off from Peirce, right? Um, and I mean, I probably both Peirce and Heidegger got it from this crazy guy, Jakob Berm, but we don't really know. Um, but this is really Peirce, right? You, you start with like non-being, non-being negates itself and uh, you've got being itself. And I, I, you know, to my mind, that's just, I, I love Peirce. I'm just, you know, fascinated by Peirce, scared of Peirce. You know, I see Purse, like I wake up in the middle of the night and Purse is outside the window. He's got like a hat on and shit. And, uh, you know, that idea that, it, you know, you say like, well, so this is threatening to theists. Why is there something, you know, they're always like, why is there something rather than nothing? Uh, and, you know, um, I should do like, I have a flashlight here. I should do the, uh, I should do the, yes. why is there something <laughs> rather than nothing? I love it. You know, and, uh, you know, I mean, Peirce has an answer to this. It's like, well, you know, if you're going to answer that question, you have to start with nothing. You can't start with any something. You got to start with nothing. And if you got nothing, all you got is negation. And all the nothing can do is negate itself. And what's that? The negation of nothing is being. So is the idea here, I'm having trouble wrapping my mind around this. So, cause <laughs> first is like, you know, he's, he's a little bit, he's interesting. He scares me as well. So um, let's see, is the idea that just non-being or nothingness negates itself in the sense that non-being is sort of contradictory and so it's like just net it strictly entailed that there must be something or other um it's like necessary uh, i'm like what is this negation like how could right because if we're talking about nothingness non-being there's nothing there to negate itself right like <laughs> i i almost don't understand how it could negate itself so is the idea more so like a kind of logical explanatory one where non-being is contradictory and that is why um we have something it's like because contradictions can't obtain like could you could you take us through like what is this non-being negating itself yeah yeah sure and and sort of the persian dialectic of that right is so you've got non-being and non-being is just negative right there isn't really it's not even really accurate to say like you know you can't say there is non-being yeah right there's oh there's non-being well no there isn't <laughs> right yeah there isn't non-being right and and that's exactly what you can say there isn't, and that's negativity, right? 
it's just pure negativity. Um, and it's nice. It sees it's really nice. And person is really smart because it's great. You say that's what it is. Right? It's pure negativity. And this negativity just negates itself. Right? There's nothing for it to negate but itself. Right? Its negativity is so intense. I mean, to put it a little poetically, right? That um what what does not you know nothing right i mean heidegger made the nice sentence right the famous sentence you know das nichts nichtet the nothing nothings yeah <laughs> that's what it that's that's what it does right it just nothings and it nothings itself right and those clever buddhists you know they're always mystical guys right uh yeah you know nishitani right and uh uh the similar ones, right? Say like, oh, well, this is this Buddhist idea, you know, emptiness empties, it's, you know, you empty, empty everything, get rid of everything, you've got emptiness, so you got to get rid of the emptiness itself. And once you've emptied emptiness of emptiness, <laughs> right, then like everything is back. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, I think that these are good questions, the logic of it, Right. And I like the notion that um, you know, so Graham Priest is another person who's written about some of the issues around nothingness and, <laughs> yeah. and, and this kind of thing. Right. And, and if you really pursue a lot of logical stuff, because um, I like logic, if you really pursue it, you really get to these kind of fundamental, I think, platonic or Parmenidean kinds of questions. Right. Where. I mean, Plato is going through them in the Parmenides, you know, Socrates talking to Parmenides allegedly. And you've got all this stuff about, well, non-being is not, right? And non-being is not, so what is there? Well, there's not non-being. And so, I mean, that would seem sort of to follow from non-being is not. If non-being is not, then what there is is not non-being. Mm -hmm. Now you can't really formalize that, right? Because you don't, I mean, if you're, if you're looking for the foundations of logic, you don't really have logic yet, right? Like you're trying to figure out where do the true and the false come from, right? Why are the laws of logic true, right? Or why are they laws of logic, right? And, you, and to avoid, you know, circularity, you can't just say like, well, and even, even circularity isn't really an issue. Like, why is there bivalence? You know, the law of bivalence and the law of non-contradiction. So let's go, we've got the one, we got the self-negation of non-being gives up with, that's the platonic zero, right? Which actually, you know, Dean Inga, this English guy who wrote a two volume treatise on Plotinus says, well, you know, if the Platonists had known about the zero, they would have started there, <laughs> right? He did not know that Iamblichus, right? So you got Plotinus, you got Porphyry, and then next is Iamblichus in the, the golden chain of successors. Iamblichus is the first guy to treat zero, the first known writer to treat zero as a number. Interesting. Yeah, and um, this was only recently um, discovered. You know, there are old manuscripts found, an old treatise that Iamblichus wrote on arithmetic and I think that was only like discovered in the 1980s or something. You know, it was found literally, it was like one of these things that was found in a monastery. And somebody's like, oh, wait, this is Yamplicus. This is amazing. Wow. Um, and we have the first argument, a mathematical argument that the number zero, there must be a number zero. It's a great argument. He's like, you know, if you take any number right, it, and you add up the numbers on its side and divide by two, you know, and all this stuff. And he's like, well, if there's one, it's got two on the one side, it's gotta have something on the other side for this principle to hold. And that's gotta be zero. Uh, so it's the first existence argument for uh, a number, right? So it's, it's, you know, so we start with this platonic zero, non-being negates itself, you get being itself. And now you're looking at logic and you're trying to figure out something like, well, look, okay, if you have P and not P and you just make a logical diagram, a table, right? There's four ways that could go, 
right? You write P, you write not P beside it, and you've got true, 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 false, false, true, false, false, right? You can really pick any of those, right? I mean, I mean, syntax doesn't tell you which of those should be the case, right? Why should why should you know P and not P not be equivalent? Mm -hmm. And um, you know you can you can deduce that sort of thing from the self-negation of non-being, right? I mean, you can run arguments that say, look, right, the two can't be, and these are very platonic kinds of arguments that you know the, and you find hints of them in people like Plotinus and in the Parmenides, you know, like look, the two can't be one. Right, and if you've got the true and the false, I mean, already the true and the false parallels, right? The false is like non-being and, and the true is like being. And so these two cannot be made one. So, so you got, I mean, you got to work this out, right? And it's not something that's easy to just, you know, summarize, uh, you know, real quick, right? Because you got to actually work it, work it out very carefully and precisely, but you can give reasons why, or you can show, uh, in a kind of deduction or proto deduction, why this kind of why the laws of logic have to be That's interesting or, or, or if you've got if you start with the self negation of non being, and you get being itself from this right that this is a kind of of proto logical transformation and it's going to give you the laws of logic it's going to give you of the law of bivalence, it's going to give you the law of non-contradiction, it's going to give you the law of identity, the law of substitution, right? So, um, and you can find those kinds of, you know, you know, you find Aristotle being like, well, why are there, why these are, why are these the laws of logic, right? I mean, it's not obvious. Yeah. And and presumably you wouldn't want to just say. These are the laws. That's it. Yeah. And if you're a, if you're a theist, you might want to say somehow these emerge from the divine will or God's goodness, right? So um, you know, and theists are, are theists like to claim that kind of thing, right? They like to say, well, look, you you atheists with all your science and all your reason, <laughs> you know, uh, you guys can't you guys have no explanation for the laws. Like you just take the laws of logic on faith. Yeah. Right. And so you have no rational basis or worse, right? Uh, Ed, uh, Ed Fazer gave a review of Alex Rosenberg's book in which he accuses Rosenberg of just massive self-contradiction. Right of saying you know there's there's no uh, you know no value distinctions blah 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 no normativity except for one right logic is normative and and now the position actually simply refutes itself directly yeah, yeah. right. I mean, you just like, you know, made a book length argument that there <laughs> is no normativity right. And you're like, well, isn't logic normative? And then, then the whole project goes to shit. And it's just, <laughs> you know, and, you know, I, I, yeah, it's really, to me, you know, maybe I'm crazy, but I think like those things bother me. Yeah. Right. Like if I want to have a coherent, if I want to be, I, I, I shouldn't do worse reasoning than the theists that I oppose. Yeah. Right. I, I mean, I shouldn't have a word, a deeper and more, mis more obscure form of faith. You know, um, so, yeah, you want to try, I think that I think Platonism helps you do this. Right. I'm I'm I fully embrace the worry or the thought that like, well, look, maybe the Platonism is just another story. Right. And yeah, it ends up being super rational, which I love. Yeah. Right. And it's co cons it's self consistent. Right. Which I think most contemporary atheism is not. You know, most contemporary atheism, I think, assumes right a whole lot of principles that it can't justify. 
it assumes massive normativity um, in logic, in science, right? It makes all these assumptions about truth. And, you know, it's sort of like, well, we're rationalists, we're rational, but there are no reasons at all for what we're doing. Yeah. You know, and that's not self consistent, that's just self refuting. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and, and people like Planninga and Craig and then, you know, Fieser, they've seen that. Yeah. Right. Um, I mean, you know, all, all kinds of people have seen that. Right. Like Hume, who wrote the first, he didn't see it. And most atheists don't. Right. Hume wrote the first self-burning book. <laughs> yes. Right. I mean, maybe you've heard that. Right. You know, that the end of end of that book. Right. On uh, Acid to the Flames. Yeah. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, it can for contain nothing but sophistry and delusion. Um, and you ask him about his book. You know this story. It's like, okay, wait, I just I just read this this book. Was that damn the title of it I'm blanking out on right now? The <laughs> the principle, what is it? The understanding? because uh, there's two with very similar titles. Um an inquiry concerning human understanding. Is that what it is? I think that's the one, the inquiry. Yeah. And and let's just say it's that one. <laughs> And, um, you know, forget about history and, and dead people. But, but that book ends up saying, like, if, if ask of any, go through your library and pick any book. And, and does it, it contain, you know, a discussion of matters of fact? Or right? relations of ideas. Right. Yeah. Well, matters of fact and, you know, basically mathematics. Yeah. Right. And if not, cast it to the flames. And you pick up that book and go, like, well. <laughs> that very claim. <laughs> It just refutes itself. Mm -hmm. It's like Copple Copleston's famous debate with uh, A.J. Ayer, you know, on the verification principle, mm -hmm. right? And he's just like, you know, verificationism is unverifiable. And Ayer is like, wait, what? <laughs> you know, it's beautiful. It's like, the, I don't know if you read that debate. There was a radio debate between Ayer and Copleston on the BBC, I think, 19... 36 or something wow. or, or 38 wow. um that's a dinosaur and yeah and a you know cobbleston just saves it for the end right he's like oh just one it's like you know like i oh, just one more thing he's like this verification principle you know and he just asks air to apply it to himself itself and air's just like <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I can definitely see how that can provide a motivation for getting this more metaphysical, robust form of pl Platonic atheism or atheistic Platonism. So yeah, I can I can totally see that. I guess two things that I want to touch on. Um, uh, I know this is getting slightly away from your book, but like arguments for Platonism and maybe talking about, um, I know we've been talking a lot about value and goodness and so on so maybe the foundation for that within your atheistic um, platonism so first let's go to what are what are some reasons why we should be platonist with respect to say mathematical objects or these other sorts of things like why be a platonist because you don't want to make your mom cry <laughs> i think look there's a lot i mean you know there's a lot of arguments for that mm -hmm. right i mean first of all if you want to go one route and so the book doesn't actually touch on any of those arguments Right, because first of all, those arguments have been made for like two thousand years. Yeah. Right, and it's not my intention to persuade anybody that like Platonism is true. Mm -hmm. yeah, right? you're, you're just building out the worldview, right? That's right. I'm building yeah. out the worldview, and I'm showing what it can do relative to theism. Mm -hmm. Right, like there are there are hundreds of books that you can you know read, get from the library or buy or whatever, if you want to see arguments about. I know why I think that you know mathematical realism is yeah. valid right so that would be you know beating a dead horse and it's also not what i want to do right what i want to do is show that platonism is a rival to theism mm -hmm. right that's the task and to show atheists why platonism makes for a better atheism yeah right now one of the things i, I will say is that the approach i take to platonism in the book i mean i want to explain to you why, right, there's this very rational, uh, very logical derivation of, for instance, the axioms of set theory, 
right? If we start from this Persian thing about the self-negation of non-being, you got being itself, we've got these principles, you're gonna get a lot of, and we're gonna have the laws of logic, you're gonna get a variety of maximization principles, and you're going to get um, something like the axioms of set theory, which already are based on maximization principles. So I'm going to I'm going to derive mathematics, you know, from the one, or from the zero, from non-being, in a way that would be very different from somebody who says they're going to say like, well, the indispensability argument, math is useful in science, mm -hmm. right? That I take to be a very Aristotelian argument, and as everyone knows, Aristotle made poor life choices, and you know we're we're gonna we're gonna let him be himself uh <laughs> but that's not that's not platonism mm -hmm. this bad stuff man don't try you know don't try <laughs> you get hooked on that shit and you know uh so so i would yeah i would caution everybody that that's not the task at hand right to to convince anyone that platonism is true right um i would i would hope that it, you know when people read this book they would say like oh this is you know, this presents a coherent, rational worldview. It's self-consistent. Yeah. It has, you know, whatever other attractive features of Platonism uh, has, right? And it's a modern, you know, this is analytic metaphysics. This isn't, you know, Platonism of, you know, 400 BC, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I want to develop this in the other ways. I want to be developing out, building out a contemporary theory of value right, from it, right, build, building out the contemporary framework of, of the metaphysics and ontology, building out a contemporary axiology, right, a theory of value that, um, again, why, where does value come from? You know, objective necessary laws of value. Uh, obviously, this is one of, you know, contemporary atheism's biggest Achilles heels, mm -hmm. right, or biggest, I don't know how big a heel can be, but <laughs> it's a weak spot, right? And atheists often seem proud of this. Like, we don't believe in objective moral values. It's like, yeah, like 95% of humanity just ran away from you. <laughs> yeah, probably higher. Probably higher. <laughs> and, and oh, also, by the way, you don't have any reason for saying that. Like, if yeah. what you were saying was true, there again, you know, you would be what? Are you a liar? It's kind of like if if what you're saying is true that there are no objective values does that mean there's no difference between truth and falsity there's no difference between telling a lie and telling the truth right i mean it seems like it's different it's difficult on on the contemporary atheistic views to get any normativity at all i mean we're back to that yeah. rosenberg uh nihilism right and and the you know the self-refutation of it and so, but I, you know, I think it's a, it's a terrible, a terrible weakness. Um, you know, and I, you probably don't have to be a, a Platonist to believe that either, but um, yeah, I want to build out a theory of value, right? This whole chapter devoted to axiology, where we really build out an evolutionary, uh, you know, like, I mean, Platonism, I think is going to give you evolutionary principles, um, principles that go from simplicity to complexity. Uh, and there are, I, I think, really nice arguments um, that show the emergence of increasingly complex systems of value, right? And I think values start, I think normativity starts, as you know, with logic, it builds up. I mean, everything in biology has normativity built in, even physics has normativity built in at the very basis. Um, so there's, yeah, so that I think is, and, and part of it's just interesting to do because I don't think anybody's done this. Mm -hmm. Eric um, Eric Wielenberg has done yeah. some things on this, but he's more focused on ethics, right? Human ethics. Yeah. Right. Um, and I want to show because we played in this, we have the good. You know, I want to show why uh, you know nature is saturated with goodness. It's saturated with value. Uh, oppose, you know, this is this is the anti Rosenberg, right? Yes. Like that yeah. guy's wrong about everything, <laughs> you know? So, uh, yeah, 
And you know, I also want to talk about the kinds of practical things. You know, Platonism isn't just a bunch of abstract stuff like, oh, the number five is is bigger than six. No, wait, <laughs> wait, I have a proof. You know that you know there's there's lots of stuff you can do, mm-hmm. right? Um, so so lots of lots of practical kinds of. Um, symbolism there were lots of platonic practices right uh theurgy which is really kind of interesting to think about um you know uh and i sort of interpret that in a kind of transhumanist way yeah um and you know i pick up i like picking up on the transhumanist notion of gods right that the the gods are superhuman machines and some of them say we we will become them But like, you know, uh, AI, right? Or you know, people like, I mean, you know, you know, the usual suspects, Hans Moravec and Mark. Nick, ba- Nick Bostrom, and Rick yes. Kurzweil, <laughs> right? I mean, so, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with talking about gods and goddesses and, and infinitely many of them. Mm-hmm. Right? The transhumanists talk about that all the time. Mm-hmm. And they, they don't mean like, you know, also all these atheists are like, oh, there are no gods, none at all. Uh, <laughs> and you just kind of like, well, what about what would about like a superhuman computer the size of the planet Neptune? You know, that you know whatever, you know. I mean, then I would turn to to Kurtzweil. I mean, right? And I don't have to defend that. I don't have to, you know, believe that such a thing exists, right? But um there are ways to conceive of superhuman. Like, I mean, one of the beautiful things about artificial intelligence, right, is it gives you a way of thinking about things that are superhuman. It gives you a way of thinking about superhuman minds. You know, for like 2000 years, people are like superhuman minds, they must be these supernatural spooky things. Now you're like, no, there's one in the other room <laughs> and it wants to kill us all. <laughs> you know, um, so... Yeah, it's no longer like a, 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 you know, or there's genetic engineering, right? Or there's there's whatever. There are the, you know, the post-humans, the transhumans, the superhuman beings that, I mean, the most of the classical transhumanists like Bostrom, right? Uh, and, and classic scholars have noted this, right? Bostrom basically is arguing for theurgy. He's saying we should transform humans into Olympian deities. His picture of the transhuman is the picture of the Homeric Olympians, right? I mean, and so, and but there's one guy, Harari, right, who wrote the book uh, Homo Deus. Oh yeah, um, yeah, and and he he picks up on this theme, right? He's like, well, these guys are just talking about the Olympian deities, mm-hmm. right? Um, and there's also uh, Susan Levin, a classicist, who uh, has also picked up on this this theme. Right. She doesn't like it, but yeah. Um, so those are some of the themes. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that you point out some of the more practical aspects of it, you know, as analytic philosophers, you know, we're like typically thinking about the derivations and the arguments and the, the, the dialectic and the more abstract stuff. But it's interesting to see how you take this worldview and you're like, hey, not only do we have the kind of more robust metaphysical aspects of the worldview and so on, but we also have a more platonic way of life you know it gives you these principles of living and so on um practices and uh, all these other sorts of things so it's yeah. really pretty interesting fun shit to do man <laughs> including buying those like crystals so buying um, crystals going to raves man <laughs> taking psychedelics you know contemplating the form of the good oh yeah man Right. So uh, I'm all I'm all for it. I mean, you know, there's all this research on psychedelics and um, those kinds of things. And, you know, the last chapter in the book is on atheistic mysticism. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, why let all why let the theists have all the fun? You know, yes. Um, I was going to say, like, uh, in the chapter abstract for that, you say 11 detailed cases of atheistic mystic mystical experience are examined. So like, I kind of want to talk about these like what are what are these cases of obviously we're not going to go through all 11 of them but you know maybe you could like pick one of them and we could just talk about it so like what is this atheistic mysticism or atheistic platonic mysticism yeah well there are atheists who have had like full-blown mystical experiences i mean that's the simple story right 
And I went and I went and tried to find because I wanted to find concrete cases, you know. Um, so like these are these are the cases where someone is it like uh, they almost feel at one, like almost like they feel unified with something, like their ego dissolves and they, like I don't I, I like what is a mystical experience? Can you tell us about that? Yeah, no, <laughs> uh, can't not gonna do that. But these are full-blown mystical experiences, right? That have all the sort of psychological phenomenal hallmarks of like, you know, that typical theist mystical experiences yeah. do. I mean, mystical experience is probably something that's just kind of hardwired into human brains because they appear in all cultures that we know about, right? People have these kinds of experiences, unitive experiences, you know, the oceanic feeling, whatever yeah. you want to call it. But there are atheists who have had these. I'll pick one, Pierre Hadot, who was a Catholic, devout Catholic, or he thought he was. Um, and in his, uh, he actually became a priest. And in his, uh, starting in his uh, teenage years, he had these mystical experiences of like, you know, yeah, the unity of nature, you know, the infinity, like he would have these full blown ego dissolution, yeah. the whole thing, the starry sky. And they were often like you know, starry skies or mountains. He writes about them, he describes them, you know, and he had these mystical experiences um, and just dissolving into the, you know, the absolute infinite oneness of being. And he was terrified of these experiences because they, they were purely atheistic. They proved to him that there is no God. <laughs> Right, and they made him initially double down on his Catholicism. Right, and and he thought he was a you know he he was like I'm a terrible Catholic. I'm having these mystical experiences, which which actually, and he writes this. This is not interpretation. Right, he's like you know I have these experiences that show me directly that there is no God. And and they seem to have all the hallmarks of, you know, sort of Christian mysticism. And these experiences, you know, they go on for probably 10 years and during his priesthood, and he actually studies mysticism, thinking that if he studies it, maybe he'll have, maybe God will come to him. But every time, every time, no God. <laughs> and it forces him to leave the priesthood. He becomes an atheist. You know, it's as simple as that. Right. He uh, so he's a very interesting case where the experiences um, psychologically phenomenally, they resemble, you know, the, the uh, experiences of, uh, you know, Hildegard von Bingen or someone. But there's just no God, you know, and the experiences reveal this to him. This is not his interpretation, according to him. Yeah. Right. He has the and what he is experiencing. Right. It is not God, right? He, he knows this with the certainty of the experience itself. And he can't, you know, eventually he's just like, okay, I quit. So is, is it like, does he, I know you probably, you like, you're acquainted with like what he himself like actually writes. So is he, um, does he, is the experience like he, he experiences something that's ultimate but also experiences that somehow it's not God that is the ultimate thing. Is that really what's happening? Because it's I'm, I'm trying to get my mind around how someone can experience, like we have to distinguish between not experiencing God and experiencing the absence of God, you know? So it's like, I wonder how he, how does he kind of distinguish between simply not experiencing God versus experiencing no God, you know? There's a kind of distinction there. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I'm not sure from, I, I don't want to do too much interpretation of him. Yeah. I mean, you know, but he seems very clear that, I, I mean, certainly as a guy who's really well versed in Catholicism, uh, you know, who's a priest, who's taken vows, he seems to have a pretty good idea what he thinks God is. Mm -hmm. And this ain't it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, there's something about the experience that I don't know, it's missing or there's maybe a positive, he writes about the experience in, you know, more positive terms, the experience of a kind, you know, the unity of being, you know, the ground of being, but it's clear to him that it's not God. 
right? Um, and yeah, you know, I don't think I want to say, I don't, I think I'd be starting to attribute yeah. my own stuff to him, Yeah, you know, but he's clear enough, right? You know, for whatever reason, uh, I don't recall him making that kind of distinction about, mm -hmm. about, well, it's just not God versus, you know, sort of the absence of God. Sartre had mystical experiences like that, similar to this too. He, but he's sketchier about it, right? And and that's what led him to become an atheist, mm. right? He's a little sketchier about about it, um, so I couldn't quite use him as an example. But there's lots of them. I mean, Nietzsche had these kinds of experiences. Pierre Hadot, um, John Dewey, uh, Bertrand Russell. Bertrand really? Russell. Really? Yeah, Bertrand Russell had a has had a a transformative mystical experience. See, when I think of Bertrand Russell, I think it, it, I just think of this paradigm, just like logical analysis, this analytic mind who's just like dry and linguistic analysis, like. Ah, <laughs> uh, no, man, Russell is all, Russell is a, come on, man. You got to read his autobiography. I mean, it's a big, thick book, but it's fascinating. Well, I, I know that he like, um, well, I know that he was like, he was a big activist. I do know that. Yeah. I, he, he was like an activist against fascism and all these other sorts of things. And I'm like, you go queen, like, that's good. <laughs> Free love, dude. Free love. <laughs> you know, he was denied like a uh, position, I think at Columbia because of his free love. Um, oh my goodness. <laughs> John Sob well, he was banned, like an act of Congress, like banning him from teaching in the United States, <laughs> you know, uh, and, which was because he, he advocated open marriage. Uh -huh. They didn't care about his atheism. They're like, yeah, whatever, dude. You know, <laughs> you know, we know, you know, but free love, no. Yeah, Russell, I mean, Russell starts his life, as, he's trained to be a spy, man. He's a <laughs> diplomat, right? Like people think Russell is a philosopher. He spent, I think, like three of his 96 years as a philosopher. You know, he was trained to be a spy. He was a diplomat. He, you know, he was basically a spy when he was a diplomat. Right, and then I mean, he's trained as a mathematician, but really he's a spy. Interesting. And his mission was to go to Europe. He was a polymath who spoke like nine languages, and to go to Europe and bring back scientific and mathematical treatises in his diplomatic pouch. This is how he discovered Frege and piano. Right. I mean, that was his job. It was his assignment. He was the number two ambassador, mm -hmm. British ambassador in Paris. And that was his instruction because the Brits were like, we don't know what scientific stuff that we hear the Germans are like doing all this science and we don't know what the hell it is. You go find out. Uh, but then he, you know, yeah, he becomes a journalist, right? He writes for uh, uh, Hearst, right? The guy, the guy lives in a cabin in the Sierra Nevada mountains in California for, for like a decade. He built a log cabin in the mountains, right? I mean, yeah, people have this very weird image of him that's not at all his life, right? That he's like Henry David Thoreau, he's like somebody else. Yeah, okay, yeah, you know? I was about to say, I know that there was some poet that like built a cabin in the woods or something like that. Lived yeah, some poet, oh, geez, man. <laughs> Why do you hate America? <laughs> oh, man, Henry David, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't read Walden? Uh, I'm uncultured, so <laughs> Walden kind of Walden kind of sucks, but yeah, yeah. There's better stuff by Thoreau, but yeah, Russell is not the guy you think. Mm -hmm, that's interesting. You know, I, and yeah, Russell has this mystical experience that changes him from a guy who had been an arch conservative in the sort of this British sense, right? He's not American, right? Into this crazy, crazy activist liberalist. Mm -hmm. He'd been like, you know, pro-war, pro, you know, British Empire. And he had a he had like a five-minute mystical experience that <laughs> completely ethically transformed him. Interesting. You know, um, but there's no God. Right. Uh, so uh, I mean, John McTaggart that I mentioned earlier, he had mystical experiences really? all the time. Yep. Uh, which led him to develop his philosophy that everything is love. Everything, ultimately, everything is love. It's all love, man. 
Um, and uh, yeah, I'm not even talking about the like LSD people, you know, <laughs> the, the space people. Yeah. Uh, you know, so so if we go through that, we got already, you know, like Pierre Hadot, there's Bertrand Russell, um, you know, John Dewey, Nietzsche, McTaggart. There's a whole lot. Uh, and I, you know, Ursula Goodenough, I mean, uh, Arthur Kessler is an interesting guy, journalist who was imprisoned in the Spanish Civil War, um, and he was going to be shot. Bang, they're going to shoot him, firing squad. And um, uh, he amused himself in his cell with a piece of iron scratching mathematical proofs into the wall. And he's an amateur mathematician, he liked math. And he was proving, he was writing out Euclid's proof that there's an infinity of prime numbers. And like, you know, the prison dissolved, man. It all dissolved. And, and he saw through, you know, the superficial layers of reality. He said, X-ray vision, <laughs> you know. Have you ever and, had a mystical experience? Yeah, I have them all the time. Yeah, <laughs> not so much anymore. They're just migraine auras, man. Oh, man. No. Yeah, there's not, I don't want to discount them, you know, like how intense and, and, and fun they and terrifying they can be. But I think they're just migraine. I, my, that doesn't, I don't discount them. I don't think they're just subjective, right? But I think that's the machine. I think probably most people would agree with me at this point. Interesting. That they're mainly migraine auras. Ah. Uh. Um, so why now you're disappointed no no i've 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 had some migraines in the past like some not not now thankfully i i do not have them but i used to get them like often and it oh, they're so painful and then the ores that would come before it and you're just like you know that you're about to have a terrible day and it's like you see the stars and everything it's terrible yeah see <laughs> man you see that you see the black sun open up ah. right in front of your eyes ringed with fire <laughs> you know it's, it's serotonin man it's just like all your uh but then you're not getting the are you not getting the dumps in your aura where like all your little uh, your little blood cells the uh, platelets dump all their serotonin that's the bliss man <laughs> no I always it was always just like stars and blurriness that's what I remember it was a bunch of I remember colors stars swirling blurriness and yeah. then that would be for like thirty minutes and then you get hit with the the ten out of ten pain of a migraine. Um, right. And you're just devastated. You're, you're in your totally black room. Just the worst experience ever. <laughs> oh, wow. You're just you're just having the ones that go to hell. You're just like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you just you're like, you got to Yeah, you have to change your lifestyle, man. That Well, it's not anymore. This is way back. This is way back when this is like freshman uh, year of high school. So yeah, a while ago. Yeah, I mean, I started taking like magnesium supplements and I don't get those anymore. Interesting. So <laughs> Yeah, most people that's a that's that's this first that's the number one uh, thing that you would get advised to do with migraines. Nice. Right? Like even if you go to a, like a migraine doctor, they're going to be just like, "Why well, are you taking magnesium?" Right? Um, you should be taking magnesium supplements. And at least in my case, right, it just stopped. Nice. So, well, I don't know. You know, I don't see the <laughs> I don't see the black sun anymore. I don't you know. Yeah. So, you're not you're deprived of your interaction with the form of the good basically weed is legal in new york <laughs> you know oh man okay well i think i think we kind of got through the uh you know we touched on briefly each chapter but um we, now that we're finishing up with this chapter nine atheistic mysticism i guess do you have anything to say before we um you know to close it out by way of conclusion I, no, I mean, I think that, well, a little bit. I mean, I think that uh, that was great. It's great discussion of sort of the idea. It's it's still being written, you know, I think mm -hmm. things could change, but I think that most of it is 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 set and um, you know, it takes it takes years for these things to appear. But um, I, I, you know, I've had a lot of interactions with various theistic philosophers and others who are like, wow, this is this for them, it's scary stuff. And, and you know, hopefully, uh, you know, atheists who want sort of, you know, a rational, cons a consistent, right, self consistent worldview, right? I don't try to, you know, tell you that this worldview is true, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not for me to say. I'm trying to set it out um, and, you know, defend it, work through its consequences, show what it can do. 
um, and why why it would be good to adopt it. Whether people think it's it's valuable, it's true, that's something that's a whole other kind of thing, right? Because the first thing is it has to be set out um, with its structure, its implications, and and its arguments. Uh, so there it is. Yeah, it's the it's the, uh, it's, the it's the new new atheism. Yes. <laughs> you know? um, so yeah. Yeah, well, um, uh, thank you for coming on. Everyone check, oh, yeah. links, you check links in the description um, to the chapter abstracts as well as the extended table of contents. And everyone, uh, if you've made it this far, you probably see value in what I do. So please consider becoming a patron. You can help me upgrade from eating dirt as a college student to eating something that is slightly more appealing than dirt. So I do appreciate that, all my, all my peeps, my patrons. <laughs> so um, yeah, I guess um, what better way to end is there for our video than uh, I'm Joe Schmidt. This is The Majesty of Reason and peace out. Hey.